Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird Movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone. This is episode number 121 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we look back at the Berlin Airlift. Now, before we get started, as always, if you could just do us a favor, take a moment to like, or subscribe or share and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, click that bell icon and you'll get notifications when new episodes of Warbird Tube are posted. Now, as you're watching, you may have some questions. Just type them in the questions section and we will answer them before we sign off tonight. So joining me now from Madison, Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Veterans Museum is Museum Director Chris Kolakowski. Chris, welcome back. Good to be back, Steve. Always great working with you. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, tonight we're going to kind of move a little further away from World War II, but not by much, and uh, talk about an, uh, a period of time in, in history that, that sometimes gets overlooked, and that is the very important uh, Berlin airlift. So uh, let's take a look. Uh, we're looking at uh, Germany in 1945, and that'll help transition us uh, at least to get historically where we need to be. Exactly. You know, the Berlin Airlift, this is an important event. It's an important anniversary because, you know, June 24th, 1948, it, um, was the start of the Berlin blockade by the Russians. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. The 75th anniversary is June 24th, 2023. So we're right, right in that period now. Um, and actually, to your point, our story really starts at the very end of World War II with the German surrender on May 7th. They sign it May 7th. It takes effect May 8th. And Germany is then divided into several occupation zones, and you can see them marked here. Germany and Austria, actually. Um, and then Austria in 1955 becomes um, independent and neutral. Um, the eastern part becomes the Russian zone, as you can see. The British with a U.S. enclave in the north. The French down in the southwest. And then the United States basically occupies Bavaria and certain other parts of central Germany as well. And then if you look real carefully in the center of the map, you'll notice Berlin is with it has marked with an arrow allied. They split the German capital also among, just like they split Germany, they split the German capital among the four major allied powers, Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And then eastern Germany, kind of where you see those two fingers kind of extending off, and then East Prussia in the northeastern part of the map get divided among Russia and Poland. And even today, if you look at the Kaliningrad, maybe another talk for another time, Steve, the Kaliningrad enclave that Russia still has is the northern part of East Prussia. Um, so the territorial, the, basically the modern map of Europe is drawn in 1945 um, with a divided Germany. And, and, and this was all, you know, divided, uh, you know, you said divided Germany, but what was what was the thought of uh, actually splitting Berlin? I mean, that was in the Russian zone, right? And so what was the, the thought behind subdividing that even further? Well, the idea of the occupation was that it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be temporary. And the idea as well was that the four powers were supposed to govern Germany together. So even though they had their own occupation zones, there was a, a four power council that met in Berlin. The idea was that Berlin was going to remain the German capital. And so the idea is, if the Allied occupation government is going to meet for anything that deals with the entire country in Berlin, let's divide Berlin and give everybody a base. Now, significantly, the agreements on Berlin cover air corridors. They preserve air corridors in because they want to deconflict Allied air you know, the, the various air traffic that you might get into Berlin from the occupation forces, diplomats, things like that from the from the Western powers, from what the Soviets are doing and Soviet air force is flying. But they 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 leave out. They they don't talk about land. There's no legal guarantees. There's no treaty that governs land communications into Berlin. The idea the Russians just say, oh, we'll take care of it. You know, you can you can access Berlin by land however you need. We don't need an agreement. 
Allies, fine, no problem. That's a detail that is going to come back to loom very large in a few years. Indeed. And uh, let's meet a few of the, the players who are instrumental in, in the uh, history of the uh, airlift. So this is Lucius Clay, who's kind of a forgotten American, but, but deserves far more recognition. He is remembered very strongly in Germany, I might add. Um, he was the Allied governor of Germany, or the, the American governor of Germany. And um, he is one of the most important figures in the whole Berlin crisis and the Berlin airlift. He becomes, in many ways, the symbol of the Ameri America and the Allied resolve. Um, and is a very prominent voice. He's a son of a senator. He's from Georgia. He's the son of a senator, West Point man, had spent time in the Corps of Engineers um, and was also the guy in, in World War II that went over, opened the port of Cherbourg during the Normandy campaign to supply Eisenhower's armies, had done a lot of civil construction, done a lot of airport construction around the country at the beginning of World War II. In fact, a lot of the smaller airfields particularly in the central part of the United States that are still in operation today, he helped build under the Depression-era programs in the late 1930s. So he's a fascinating guy, and he's the man who's tapped in 1945 to be the governor of Germany. And in, he has that job all the way until his retirement from the U.S. Army in May of 1949. Uh, but very, very strong leader. Um, the more I study this guy, the more impressed I am with him. He is, he's one of those soldier statesmen that America, the American army produces and fi finds and puts in the right place at the right time from time to time, and this is one of those cases. All right, here we get a little closer look at uh, occupied Berlin. Yeah, this is a 1945 map, and it, it may be difficult to read on the screen, but basically you'll notice the Russians have the eastern part of Berlin, um, and then the kind of the darker red and then the light red to the west are the French to the north, and then Spandau and Charlottenburg is the British, and then the southern part there is the United States. Um, and if you look kind of in the center part of Berlin, which is the area of, of Mitte, Prenzlauersburg, Horst Wessel, kind of directly in the center of the map, if you remember from the Cold War, the famous Brandenburg Gate and some of those images, that's where all that is. And that's where kind of where all three of them come together is right there in the central part of Berlin, which is which is where the old Reich Chancellor's Chancellery had been, the government quarter, things like that. So it was it's kind of appropriate. Berlin City Hall is in the eastern part, is in the Russian part, but you'll notice significant parts of the city are, you know, half the city is, is governed by the West, the three Western powers. And here are her uh, gentlemen in charge. Ex exactly. This, it's not just Germany that's governed by the four powers. Within each zone, uh, the the Allied military governor, General Clay, being the American, and then there's three other, there's a French equivalent to him, there's a British one, who's a general named Brian Robertson, and then you've got a, uh, a French, uh, a Soviet Marshal Sokolovsky, and then the French is a general named um, Court. They they govern, they govern those, the, those zones themselves directly, direct rule um, through city government and through the localities, the government of the various localities. Berlin is different. Berlin is governed by the Kommandantur, as it's called. And it's a, it also has a four-power government. You can see the four representatives there. Second from the left is, is the American, um, Howley. Uh, he's known as Howlin' Mad Howley because he's got quite the temper. Um, but uh, they rule by consensus. And there is a Berlin city government, but its decisions are subject to veto by the Commandantura. Significantly, both the Commandantura and the Four Power Council, which governs the entire country, have to rule by consensus. So there's no three-to-one vote. It has to be unanimous, which makes a difference because in 1945 and 46, both the French and the Russians, for different reasons, want to keep Germany down. The French have very bad memories of 1914 and, of course, 1940. And so anything that starts to rebuild Germany, they're very concerned about. The Russians want to exploit the Germans and, and basically kick the Germans while they're down and exploit the captured German industry, the rocketry. I mean, there's so many, there's so many things that, that they exploit. And so for them, having a divided and weak Germany, because they have their own memories of 1914 and 1941, 
Um, and so for those reasons, the four power government, it, 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 it proves to be dysfunctional very quickly and it only gets worse from there. I threw this photo in because, you know, when we talk about government, what are they governing? We, 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 we need to remember how destroyed Germany was. In fact, the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey in 1945, when they assessed the impact of the Allied Strategic Bombing Campaign, described how by February 1945, Nazi Germany was no longer considered an industrial nation. So it, you can imagine that just the absolute obliteration of many of these cities. And I put this photo in here because this shows Eastern Berlin in 1946 in the Soviet sector. It shows two things. Number one, it shows, look at, look at those buildings. They're hollowed shells. And the whole city looked like that. And in fact, that looks pretty good for some of the residential sections where they are just, they're, they're pretty flat. But the other thing is you can start to see the Soviets with their propaganda moving in and starting to set up a commune, trying to set up a communist state. Um, and you'll see there the, the posters of Stalin and some of the other Russian leaders as well. Um, you know, and then you think about this and you think about the statues that later come in East Germany throughout the Cold War, things like that. You can already see that, see those seeds being planted um, right now. So this, to me, this is an incredibly evocative photo. And there's, there's a lot going on, even if it doesn't look like it on the surface. Oh, definitely. But in, aside from the, the, the Russian propaganda that, you, that is in the center of the picture, I noticed the absolute lack of any kind of vehicles. There's, there's no yes. motorized vehicles anywhere. Everyone's on foot. You can see that uh, they've got a cart in the, in, in the front, but there's no horses either. I mean, it looks like if they're moving that cart, they're going to do it themselves. So they're not going to have any help. They're doing everything by hand. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there is a, uh, I forget the exact term, but it translates roughly as rubble women. Because the, the Russians and, and even the, the Western allies, to clear the rubble of the streets and start to rebuild Berlin, they started basically paying in ration, enhanced ration cards to the people of Berlin. And because most of the men were either dead, maimed, or prisoners of war, it fell to the, to the, populate, the female population, primarily female population of Berlin, to start rebuilding the city. Um, and if you look real carefully in these pedestrians, you'll notice most of the men are older and the rest are women. And that's the population imbalance that you see because the military age men, dead, maimed, or in prisoner of war camps, some of them until 1955 in the East. So the next few years, we talked already about kind of why the French and the Russians are adopting a harder line on Germany. The United States had thought about it, too, the famous Morgenthau plan. But the British and the Americans, by 1946 and 47 realized that the Germans, a strong Germany, even just a strong German economy, which is even true today in the EU, is very much a, an, a, a, an economic engine at the heart of Europe. And that is still true today. When you look at the role the German economy plays in the European Union, it still is that way. And... The rest of Europe being war-torn, if they can reform Germany and begin to bring Germany back, it's going to help bring the rest of Europe out of the shadows of World War II. People need to remember that Europe was exhausted at the end of the Second World War, and that is true of every European nation. And just to illustrate that point, Britain was on wartime rations until 1955. Okay, so in the Marshall Plan, 1947, the Marshall Plan was very badly needed in Europe and welcomed. Um, of aid and economic development and things like that. But one of the things that is, is realized is we, we, they can't leave Germany behind. And part of that is the lessons of World War I with the Versailles Treaty where they kicked Germany down and the German economy imploded, rise of fascism. We, we've, we've talked about that in another program. So the British and the French come to this realization first, and so they begin to integrate their two sectors economically in um, you know, what's called Bizonia in 1947. And then they start to create what's called Trizonia and start bring the French a little bit more reluctantly, but the French along. And here we are by early 1948, they're realizing that the old German mark, the inflation's so insane, they just have to scrap it and issue new currency. But here's the thing. The Russians don't want to do this because they're using the devaluated mark and they're to, to keep the East Germans down and, and, and it, it goes against what they want to do, plus their political reforms, you know, their political policy, they, and they don't want to cede any control in the East to the Western powers. 
which is what accepting a new countrywide currency would do. One of the pressure points the Russians choose is Berlin, and they do a short blockade through, for technical reasons of land traffic in early 1948. Very small airlift goes on for about 10 days, and then, you know, it's, it's called the short, the little blockade, if you will. Um, nobody really thinks much about it because, you know, the, the Russians blame it on maintenance on the autobahns, which is not entirely implausible. So, but still, there's still this movement forward. It doesn't stop the momentum toward a currency. And also, when you get unified currency, okay, the next step is German government, self-government. And so there's conversations that begin in the spring 48 that really get going to create a federal republic of Germany, which we know as West Germany, of course, today is the unified, unified Germany. The Russians can't stand this. They can't have this. And so the way they decide to try and derail this whole process, because the currency is announced uh, April, uh, June 18th, 1948. The way the Russians try to derail this whole thing and hopefully force the Westerners to retreat is to blockade Berlin. And so you can see there at 6 a.m. on the 24th of June, 1948, again because of technical issues, the Russians halt all land traffic to the city of Berlin. And so that's the blockade, the blockade starting. This quote I find extremely significant. And this quote illustrates what I talked about about Lucius Clay, soldier statesman, because he understands militarily, as he said, is there's no practicability in maintaining our position in Berlin. It must not be evaluated on that basis. Berlin is militarily untenable. You're 110 miles east of the nearest friendly forces. You're behind Soviet lines, effectively militarily untenable. But he realizes, particularly as the developing Cold War is, this is not fought militarily. It's fought politically. It's fought economically. It's a battle of ideas. And in a battle of ideas, symbols matter. And he realizes Berlin has become that. He says, we are convinced that our remaining in Berlin is essential to our prestige in Germany and Europe. Whether for good or bad, it, being Berlin, has become a symbol of American intent. In other words, we can't leave. If we leave, we may never stop retreating. And communism may, may not stop advancing after Berlin. Now, when we say Berlin, this explains kind of where the situation is. What's the situation in the city when the Russians stop land traffic into Berlin. By the way, significantly, it's only land traffic in. You can go out all you want. Oh, okay. It's a one-way trip. You can go out by land all you want. Which, if you think about it, makes sense. Oh, yeah, we're not going to stop you evacuating. You can, you don't, we're not going to stop you from bringing in supplies. So the western sectors of Berlin, 2.25 million uh, population. When you figure that Berlin in 1939 was 8 million people, and the entire city has about 4 million in 1948, that should tell you something about what the war has done. Available reserves, as you can see, 30 days of food on, on hand, 45 days of fuel. The Russians shut off the electrical to the western parts of the city also. So the Berliners, in, instead of using the hydro and, and uh, some of the gas powered that are in the eastern sectors, have to activate old coal-fired power plants with effects that we will see. City requires 1,500 tons per day of food. This includes the occupation forces, by the way, of which there's basically four or five thousand um, for each power. You can see the coal fuel, available Allied aircraft. That says that is a small indicator of where the U.S. military is compared to where it had been in 1945. The massive demobilization. Uh, there's one. There's there's the equivalent of one U.S. infantry division in Germany in 1948. And there's not much more in the British or the French sectors. The Russians have 1.5 million men in East, in what will become East Germany. So, but Clay is convinced they don't want war. He's convinced that the Russians, if, if the United States and the West stands firm, they won't want war. And you can see the airfield, air, airports. There's one in uh, uh, the British sector, Gatow, Templehof, and the Americans. 
and then the French during the during the airlift will build uh, an airlift at Tegel or an uh, airport at Tegel. So that's where we are. Clay makes two phone calls on the 25th of June. First phone call is to the commander of U.S. Air Forces Europe. This guy, who I'm sure to this audience requires very little introduction for his experiences in World War II, first in Europe and then, of course, later. Um, and by the way, the independent U.S. Air Force is nine months old, September 18th, 1947. So this is actually a huge moment for the Air Force as an independent service. Um, he calls LeMay and says, can you transport coal to Berlin? And LeMay says, well, sure. How much and what do you need? And, you know, he explains. He's like, well, maybe we can airdrop. They test some airdrops over a few days. Problem is, when you airdrop coal, it explodes on the ground. So you can't do that. But LeMay also tells him you need to get to Washington and get him, get more aircraft because we can't do it with what we have here. And by the way, I'm already planning a strategic air offensive against the Russians if it comes to it. But that's the first phone call he makes, is let's get some airlift in here, let's repeat what we did in April, let's at least get some supplies in here and try and try and buy some time while we figure out how we're going to respond. So that's the first phone call. Second phone call is to a local German official. This guy, Ernst Reuter who had survived the German concentration camp, escaped to Turkey, and spent the war in exile in Turkey, had come back after the war, had been elected governor of Berlin in 1946. But the Russians, the Western powers said yes, but the Russians vetoed his election. So his business cards say, I am the elected yet unconfirmed mayor of Berlin. Ernst Reuter. And he, Clay summons him to his office and says, look, the only way that this is going to work, the only way that we're going to be able to stay here is if Berliners, if this city can hang on. And he says, I have to know, will the Berliners take it? And this is Reuters' reply, which to me is a very brave reply. General, I assure you, and do assure you, that the Berliners will take it. Berlin will make all necessary sacrifices and offer resistance, come what may. For a German municipal official in a city that looks like what we showed, surrounded by Soviet troops, to say that is, is it's difficult to overstate how significant that is. And to be honest, without the Berliners, the airlift wouldn't have worked. Right. It would not have worked. Yeah. So you mentioned the, uh, the air corridors, which remained uh, opened uh, after... Berlin was divided, and uh, as, as you alluded to, they become very important all of a sudden. Extremely important. Yeah. And this this map, um, this this is a commonly reproduced map. This is an official Air Force map that they release actually during the airlift, showing where everything is. And you can see there's significant RAF participation. Most Berlin airlift is a majority U.S. Air Force operation, but the RAF does have a role. We'll talk more about it here in a minute. But you can see the American air bases at Wiesbaden, Rhein-Main, and then a little bit further to the south, and then the, Amer the air bases in the city itself. Um, two corridors in from the northwest and southwest, and then all traffic goes out the central corridor, which uh, you know makes sense from an tra air traffic deconfliction standpoint. Um, but this is, this is what will... The airlift is a huge deal. Over two-thirds of the entire transport fleet, air transport fleet, of the United States military will be involved in the airlift by the time it's all done. They'll start with C-47s. The C-47s can carry three tons each. Most of these are World War II. Some of them are when, when General Howley sees them come in, he realizes they still have invasion stripes on them from D-Day. And here we are four years later. And they land at Tempelhof, which, of course, is one of the famous German airports. But they can only carry three tons each. So they get the big C-54s, and that those become the workhorse. There are other planes that are used as well, but these become the workhorses. You can put ten tons of goods into this. And that's food, that's coal, that's flour, that's milk. Think of all the things that a city, you can't grow from the ground, that a city needs to survive. And it has to come in on these planes here. And they scour literally all over the world, American and some British crews as well, but American crews to come. Originally, they think it's going to be, all the orders are for 90 days. 
ends up being extended multiple times. But these C-54s, this is your workhorse right here. And it's, it's the, the airlift wouldn't have succeeded without these. And you mentioned uh, RAF uh, participating as well. I threw this in here. Um, this is an RAF Handley uh, a Halifax bomber. And you'll notice on the side, this is something, says something about where Britain is. A lot of these bombers had been given over to transport commands, because if you look real carefully, just above the wingtip, there you'll see LTD for limited. That's the end of the name of the transport company that the British hired this back from. So the British are contracting out to commercial airlines and things like that that are flying old British bombers. But the British do their part. In fact, about 25% of the total supplies that go into Berlin during the airlift come from the RAF. And we should not forget that. It was the British were there shoulder to shoulder with us. And the French. The French had their own problems, particularly because of the Indochina War. But the French flew some flights in here and there, too. The Western powers, to their great credit, stood together um, through this whole crisis. And there's a nickname for you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people probably have never heard of Bill Tunner. Nope. Bill Tunner is one of the most important strategic airlift masterminds in the history of air warfare, in my opinion, and I don't say that lightly. The Hump Airlift, he masterminded to its greatest success in 1944 and 45. He also masterminded the airlift into Korea in 1950 to save the frozen Chosin when they dropped the, famously dropped the sections of the bridge. It's his people that do that. And the third thing on his resume is the Berlin Airlift. Because one of the things that Tunner has done, and, and you can get a sense of his personality, those intense look of the eyes in this picture. Um, one of the things that Tunner has realized is that airlift is a process the, of which the flight is only one part. It requires, on the uh, for departure, it requires, first of all, servicing, good servicing, loading, and then you take off. Only then do you take off. You think about everything that it takes to load the plane and then get it on and then get it out. The flight is the middle part, but then when you land, turn around. And that requires hard stands, that requires good runways, that requires trucks, that requires ground crews. And he realizes that the longer a plane sits on the ground, the less efficient it is at carrying cargo. And so he systematizes the airlift. Before it had been kind of a, a little bit more of a, you flew two missions a day and you kind of, it was a kind of a little bit more lackadaisical. He says, I want to stack this one plane every three minutes into Tempelhof. You go around, if you, if you go in, instrument flight rules, no matter what the weather is, instrument flight rules, that way there's no question about whether you can land or not. Because there are, you know, sometimes there's fog in Berlin on one, or on one side and there's not, you know, in West Germany. So instrument flight rules all the way. You go in. If you miss your first approach, you go all the way to the back of the line. And when you land, you don't get to go off and get a cup of coffee in a terminal. You stay at your plane. We bring the paperwork to you. We're hiring ex Luftwaffe ground crews to offload. And we're going to bring the donut trucks to you. I'm going to find the prettiest girls in Berlin, and they're going to, they're going to sell you refreshments. You're going to be on the ground 15 minutes, and then you're back. And then you're going to do it again. And you're going to do three flights a day. You're going to get about eight hours off. And then you go again. And how does he get people to continue to do this? Compete. He publishes daily charts. Who did what? Who's leading in the tonnage delivery? And things like that. And so it's, it's, a, really, it's a really interesting psychological study of how he you puts all these elements of an airlift together. And it's things that he learned on the hump. It's things he will do again in Korea, but he's the one who really systematizes the airlift, and it begins to not only meet the requirements of Berlin, but it begins to deliver double the requirements of the city in some cases. The peak day was t almost 13,000 tons of delivery. It's incredible what he does, and the, the airlift might have failed if it wasn't for his leadership. It's amazing. Just as, a, as an aside, uh, taking, for example, the American bases, how long of a leg was that roughly from those bases uh, to, uh, to the airports in Berlin? 
That's a great question. Um, an hour flight. Okay. If you had a tailwind, it might be 45 minutes. All right. So an hour out, an hour back, plus 15 minutes on the ground. And I'm sure the turnaround time, once they reached back to the, uh, the Allied bases, was probably 15 minutes or so anyway, right? They were pretty quick. It was a little turnaround. bit more because you have to load. It's always easier, as you know, to unload yeah, than it is to load. Mm-hmm. Um, and depending on what you're taking, some loads could be more intricate. You know, for example, it's not always food and fuel. It's at one point they actually cut a couple of bulldozers up and put them into these these planes and fly them into Berlin. So it depends on what you're loading. Say, let's let's say for the sake of argument, you, ha- you even have an hour or two to load. You know, and then you're back. So you you can do multiple four to six hour cycles in a day. And some of these guys are doing three of those or sometimes four a day. Including this gentleman, which we go from uh, from Tonnage Tunner, who's relatively unknown to Gail Halverson, who probably is a lot more well known, especially in the Warbird circles, uh, for his role in the in the airlift. I met him in 2009 yeah. and you talk about a gr- very gracious guy. Oh, yes. Um, and he's he's one of those examples of how a very humble person can sometimes make a very great difference. Gail Halverson was from Utah, and he had served in World War II, stayed in the Air Force after the war, and um, was trying to get a college education, actually, <laughs> and had been flying transports all through World War II and things like that. And he ends up going to Germany, and um, on one of his days off in July of 1948, goes and tours the city, and is really impressed at what he at the destruction and just amazed at what he sees. A lot of these pilots said that Berlin wasn't really there, because they never had time to go see the city. He was one of the few that did. And at the edge of the Tempelhof Airport, he spots a group of children and you know, goes over and just kind of talking to them. They, they sort of understand each other, but not really. But he realizes they're different than any other group of children he saw when he flew in the Caribbean during World War II. The, group, the children there would ask for candy. These kids, most of whom were probably around 11 years old, give or take three years, if you think about it, the wartime, rations, and then, of course, after the war, many of them probably have never really tasted chocolate or gum or anything like that. They're not asking for anything. And that, that struck him. And he impulsively gave him a couple of pieces of gum that he had in his pocket. He saw the reaction and impulsively said, you know what, I'm flying in tomorrow, I'll drop you some. Well, how do we know it's you? He's like, I will wiggle my wings. And he, you know, had to demonstrate what that was going back and forth and stuff. And he, they called him Uncle Wiggly Wings after that, Wackenflugel. And so he gets back to and tells his crew what they did. I'm like, are you nuts? But they go, go along with it, and they use handkerchief parachutes on Hershey bars. And when they come in for landing, they see the children, and they drop them. And they do this a few times. And then they decide, well, it's probably a good idea to stop because the group of children, they notice, continues to grow as news of this. And this is an example here of uh, C-54 dropping candy. Um, and they stop, and then the next day, <laughs> Alverson is called into his commander's office. He's like, you just, you nearly hit a reporter with a candy bar yesterday. What the hell are you doing? And he goes and he's, he's sent to Tunner. And Tunner, Tunner's like, you know what? I'm not going to court-martial you. I think this is a great, great move. You keep doing it. And some of his other crewmen, he comes back and he finds that other crewmen have bought up their entire chocolate and sweets rations and have piled it on his bed to help. The United States Air Force in 1945 brought death to the city of Berlin from the sky. And here we are in 1948. These, many of whom are the same flyers, are bringing life to the city of Berlin and are dropping candy on German children. That was remarked upon at that time, and I think it still needs to be remarked upon this time. And it's one of those just incredible human moments that, for a lot of these Germans, the fact that the Americans would drop airdrop candy, you know, it, everything else is abstract. You know, bringing in the cargo, all this other planes. You know, this is one of those moments where you can connect human to human by airdropping candy. I see you down there, Germans. I'm going to drop you some candy. It's my little thing connecting on a human level, if that makes sense. Incredibly powerful moment. It is. An an amazing story. And and, uh, if you haven't read uh, Colonel Halverson's book, you you need to. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
So this is just real quick what's going on during the blockade. Um, two to four hours of electricity every 24 hours. You're welcome to think about that as you want. Water, coincidentally, was not rationed, believe it or not. It's pretty amazing because all the, most of the water plants were in the west. But you can see the cal most, most of the population is living on 1,500 to 2,000 calories. And this is significant. The Russians offer anybody in the Western sectors, turn in your Western sector ration cards. We'll give you one. You can eat all you want. And they have food in their warehouse. They publicize the food that's in the warehouses just outside the city limits. Less than 1% accept the offer. That's huge. The other thing that starts to happen as the blockade goes on, particularly after the ration card thing, is that the, you start to see the Berlin city government begin to split where you have, because remember I mentioned City Hall is in the eastern sector. There are a lot of people that are allied with the Russians, but there are a lot of people that come from the west every day to City Hall are not feeling particularly safe anymore. And the Russians actually try to intimidation tactics and try a bit of a push against, to take over the full Berlin city government. And so basically what happens is city governments, city departments begin to split based on the personal allegiance of both sides. Berlin, the police, police department's the most dramatic. The deputy chief takes two-thirds of the force with him to the west. The chief stays in the east with the remaining third of the force. But there are these other city governments or city departments that begin to do this too. And so you're starting to see Berlin split into two cities, even if it's not formally divided yet. It's already beginning to divide politically among the people. With all that in mind, this is another huge moment, and Ernst Reuter is at the center of this. This is 300,000 people that rallied to, Ber to the Reichstag, the destroyed Reichstag, on the 9th of September, 1948. This was at the initiative of Reuter and his allies in the Western sectors. This is the largest crowd to assemble in central Berlin since the war. Since really before the war, actually. 300,000 Germans show up, and this photo tries to do justice to the size of the crowd. And Reuter gives a speech. He's not necessarily addressing the crowd as he is the world. And this is a moment, you know, Berlin has been kind of abstract in all of this, right? But this is his moment to speak to the world. And he says, today the people of Berlin will make their voice heard. You peoples of the world, you peoples of America, of England, of France, look on this city and recognize that this city, this people must not be abandoned, cannot be abandoned. People of the world, look at Berlin. This is the symbol. And when a German politician says that, you know, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. And this is just another step in what he, the commitment that he had made to Clay. No matter what, we're going to be here. We stand with you in the West. You know, three years ago, they were enemies. Right. But here they are now. Yeah, it, it is a, a very powerful, very powerful quote, very powerful time uh, as is literally the people were refocusing on on Germany, on Berlin, and the people, and what was going on there. And right. and as you you point out, I mean, these were enemies just a few years earlier, and now suddenly there's this this switch, and you know people start to they can't really understand what's going on, but they can somewhat sympathize with what's happening and and how the the power is pulling both east and west, and um, yeah. It was a, a very, like, like you said, a, a huge moment. 300,000 people, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, can you imagine in a starving, half-destroyed city right. under blockade, 300,000 people came out to stand, literally stand, for democracy and freedom. Yeah. It, 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 it makes one emotional. Yeah. When, you, when you really think about it and you read the full speech and you consider the context, it is, it, the emotion is extreme. Well, the airlift uh, continues uh, through the summer into the fall, and uh, now we're, we're heading into uh, some, some less than ideal weather conditions uh, into the winter. They fly through the winter, and this is one thing. The Russians banked on the fact that, that the airlift wouldn't, would stop. It didn't stop, and a lot of that is Bill Tunner. Yep. Now, there were times where Dunnage Dunnage diminished. There were times where flights, you know, thing, but the airlift never stopped. And because the airlift never stopped, Berlin lived. And as long as Berlin lived and stood with the West, the Russians didn't win. And that's something that should be kept on. And that's part of the impact of Bill Tunner. 
and why he instituted and the rules, the impact of the rules that he instituted. We talked about the division of Berlin. You know, because the airlift continues to fly, the situation continues to develop. There's a citywide election that the Russian side, the Russian allied parties boycott, the communist parties and socialist parties boycott. So they don't regard it as a legitimate. The Western sectors do. So basically, at the end, when Reuter is elected governor, elected mayor of Berlin, you end up having two governments, each claiming rule over the entire city. And this is really de facto at this point is where you start to get the usage of the term West Berlin, East Berlin. Reuter, as you can see, mayor of West Berlin. And this division and the, divi the hardening of the sectors, West Germany, the creation of West Germany. They, in fact, they draft a constitution in early 1949. It will later be promulgated after the crisis is over and the founding of West Germany. And then the Nash international border now of what will become East Germany, the old Soviet sector. And then on top of all this, in the, the, one of the things that happens as the crisis goes on, Europe realizes it's good to have a common defense structure. And so they signed the North Atlantic Treaty on the 4th of April 1949. So what the Russians have done is effectively push Western Europe closer together ultimately through the blockade and through the airlift because had the West not stood and had they, they not flown the airlift and sustained West Berlin I don't know if the North Atlantic Treaty is done of course NATO continues to exist to this day it will celebrate its 75th anniversary next year it's the most successful alliance in the history of the world and it has its roots right out of the Berlin airlift The Russians finally call it off one minute after midnight on the 12th of May, 1949. And, of course, you can see right here. I also like this not only because of the celebration and blockade ends, airlift wins, but note on the tail, yes. U.S. Navy. It's, it, it, the U.S. Air Force get, deservedly gets a lot of credit for the airlift, but it's not solely an Air Force show. There's Navy. There's RAF. There's all kinds that are involved as well. And that's something that should be, it's an, that should be kept in mind. These are some absolutely crazy numbers for, for this period in history. A lot of people wild. don't realize the United States military's ability to bring life in addition to fight wars. And that's, you know, Kabul airlift. I mean, there, there's a lot of others that you could argue as well. Mm -hmm. But this, this is a great example of it here. 2.3 million tons of goods were flown into Berlin. They flew 92 million miles, and you can see all the nations that were involved. Do you know what the distance from Earth to the Sun is? It's almost the same distance. As, it's just 92 million and change, so almost yeah. 93 million miles. 93. So they flew almost the distance of the Earth to the Sun. And it was not without fatalities. Right. As you can see there, 31 Americans were killed, 40 British, um, and then assorted other countries as well. The Germans actually remember all of them, and they have raised monuments in some of the old air bases to them today. Uh, there's actually a really nice one that's one half of an air bridge is, is in one of the British bases. The other half is at the old Tempelhof Airport. And you, two arcs into the sky that arc toward each other. So, But the Germans remember this. And this, deservedly so, this, this saved the city. Now, when you mentioned the fatalities, that's a statistic I had not uh, read or heard of before. And None of these were in any kind of combat situation. This was all going to be just unfortunate mishaps, takeoff, landing, errors, whatever, uh, correct? Right. Yeah. Correct, correct. Some of it's weather, most, mm -hmm. some of it's accidents on the ground, um, but it's all, it's all accidental death. I threw this in here because this is another piece that most people don't think about. Mm -hmm. Plus, it gives me a chance to highlight collections <laughs> in the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. There you go. Um, this is a guy in Madison, from Madison, who flew in the airlift. And um, the two things that I'll point out to you, number one, if you look on the right, his uh, ribbon bars, and you see in the middle one on the right there, his army of occupation, that's a device on there I very rarely see. It's the red and black one with the white ends. The plane device denotes airlift participation. You don't see a lot of those in army of occupation medals. And so that's, you know, the United States military realized what they'd done and issued a special device. But then on the, on the other side, that's a medal that the German government gave him and the other airlift pilots in 1952. 
and uh, a way to say thank you for what you have done to save Berlin and to prevent any further communist takeover. This is 1951, six years after World War II, and here they are decorating the American Air Force. You know, and so it bring, it, you know, to me, this, when you look at these two things, it brings home everything that we've been talking about and how the airlift, the American, the humanity of the American military allied with the desire of the Berliners to stand for freedom and democracy really cemented, you know, brought our two countries together out of the ashes of World War II and cemented what became a very strong alliance that remains a strong alliance to this day. And so what happened 75 years ago to me is, as, as you said at the top, is needs to be remembered better because it is so incredibly significant and is one of the finer moments in, in World War, uh, is one of the finer moments in American history since 1945. And and also, uh, as you, you pointed out, the and, and it was subtle in, in your in your commentary, but it, it actually the airlift itself and the the resolve of the the Berliners and seeing that in in Europe formation of NATO actually pushed from what the the Soviets wanted to accomplish. It actually went the absolute other way and did the opposite. It brought exactly. the Allies together in a tighter. Uh, Alliance, um, it, you know, you see France dropping their their resistance to to Germany, you know, being rebuilt, and you look at the results of of just this very short period of history. It's it's just a little over a year, but how significant an impact it had on world events even today. And it's it's something that we just sort of gloss over in, in the history books when, you know, when when uh, you're teaching high school history, it just sort of oh yeah, the Berlin airlift happened and and we move on. So, right. Yeah. Just right. No, you're right. And it, that's the view here. That yeah. is not the view in Germany. That is not right. the view in Europe. We had a common enemy mm -hmm. and we need to stand together against this common adversary, which, as you're right, continues to have echoes right up to this very minute. Yeah. All right. Well, Chris, thank you for uh, for the presentation. And we're going to uh, move over now and uh, answer some of the questions that uh, have come in from our audience. And uh, we'll then wrap things up for this evening. So this is is a, a little over a year's worth of some very significant history that uh, that, that took place and really, it, as we said, uh, continues to echo uh, today in in our in our world. Absolutely, and you know what happened seventy five years ago still is very much like yesterday. You know, World War II and its aftermath in Europe, in other parts of the world, is very much like yesterday. And when you consider it through the prism of the Berlin airlift, you know, that just further illustrates the point. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the, uh, uh, let's see, here it is. You should be seeing a C-82 on your screen right now, right? Flying boxcar. That's right. Fair chance. <laughs> C-82. And, and it was the, the uh, you had sent me some, some information about uh, the Tempelhof uh, airfield and, and some of the things that were happening there. And I, I just happened to read that the, there were a number of, not a, not a whole lot of them, but a, a few of these uh, C-82s that really wasn't a great design. And it's, it's supplanted by the, the flying boxcar, the, the 119, uh, after a few years. But it actually played a, a pretty significant role in moving vehicles, uh, vehicles in and, and out, of the, uh, out of the airlift. That's right. One of the big things, the U.S. Army needs trucks. Mm-hmm. And but the other thing is, I, I alluded to it very briefly in, in our discussion when they fl uh, cut up the bulldozers and fly them in to, to basically smooth and grade the runways for Tegel mm -hmm. Airport. They're flown in on those C 82s yeah. and some C 119s, and they fly, they fly quite a bit of heavy equipment in to do construction and including to further sustain the airlift. Yeah, yeah, including parts for uh, for, for a power station. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's it's amazing. And the, the creativity, just the sheer creativity of these loadmasters in terms of, you know, how do you do this? How do you mm -hmm. fly in a power station? How do you fly in a, a bulldozer? Um, and it, it took multiple trips on some of these planes to fly that stuff in, but they, they made, figured it out. They made it work. All right. One of our uh, audience members, uh, Bart Graham, is wondering if... Uh, he understood that Pan Am was uh, involved and had a role within the airlift. I just happened to have this 
C82 picture with TWA, but um, do you know anything about that? Pan Am, American Airlines, and TWA were contracted by the U.S. government. And okay. one of the things that it, it's it's not a very well-known, I'm glad he brought this up, it's not a very well-known part of the airlift. Most people focus on the military aspects. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of passenger traffic that needed to go back and forth as well. Um, you know, for administrative purposes, you know, General Clay, he was headquartered in Berlin, but he had responsibilities all over Germany, so he would need to fly in and out. A lot of those personnel transports were contracted with private airlines. Um, and, and we talked about it a little bit with the British as well, but uh, for the, it was the Americans, Pan Am and TWA. And they did some freight, they, you know, as you can see here with the photograph, mm -hmm. um, but they played a role as well and helped, helped move people in and out of Berlin. Yeah. It's uh, not the prettiest airplane in the world, but it certainly got the job done. And at the end of the day, that's what counts. That's it's, right. That's you can right. say the same thing about the A-10 Warthog, as a matter of fact. <laughs> there are a lot That's of people true. that swear by that thing, but it is, a, it, is not, it is not the sleekest aircraft that the Air Force has ever flown. That is true. So for those of you watching, if you do have uh, any questions, uh, just uh, type them in the chat uh, box, and we will uh, we'll, uh, save some time here, and we'll, we'll uh, take a look. Let's see here. There we go. Um, one other thing to pull up. I have too many screens. <laughs> in, in in the uh, in the information that you you sent as well, uh, they they reduced the turnaround time from sometimes an hour and fifteen minutes to down to forty five minutes uh, when they really yeah. got things moving. Uh, it was uh, it was crazy. If you get a chance, uh, William Tunner's memoirs are called Over the Hump. Okay. And it's actually a U.S. Air Force publication. So if you go into the Air Force History Office, you can download a PDF. Um, and you can, all, you know, obviously order it as well from the government press. It's really interesting how he describes how he manages these airlifts and, and what, all, what it all goes into it. Um, you know, he really, that's why I dwelt on it as a system, is he understood that it was, you know, the flight's just one part of it. It's really what happens on either end that makes or breaks an airlift. Exactly. Here's what I've been looking for. And... Uh... Looking at the uh, the diagram of, of Templehof and and how this has been organized, to uh, it, it just looks like it runs like clockwork. And that's exactly the idea. And they yeah. they one one point we should have made this is a twenty four hour operation. Yep. Um, so that's some you know people get used you know just like you hear the roar of traffic or sometimes you may hear trains or whatever people get used to the roar of airplanes overhead. Uh, but you'll notice how the planes kind of cycle in. That's that diagram shows the the famous curved hangars of Templehof Airport. Um, and then, but you'll notice if you look kind of real closely it's at the graphics, how they have all the trucks ready. That's number ten there. The alert that's also ready. You know, so they've got a con. You know, they're ready to drive out to the vehicle or to drive out to the plane, unload, do what needs to be done, and then they're on their way as the plane takes off to go back to go back from whence it has come. Okay. And it's, you know, it's a it, it's a conveyor belt of planes coming in, but it's also a conveyor belt of trucks taking the taking the the freight and the what's been delivered out to the city and where it needs to go. It's it's been a stupendous logistical achievement. Was there was there any uh black marketing uh, trucks getting lost in in traffic, supplies going where they weren't supposed to? Was there any Thing like that that was that was happening. I mean, it it seems to happen these days a lot, but uh, I don't know if it was happening during the uh, during the airlift. It did. It did happen. Um, there were a few cases here and there of pilferage. You know, you, you get that anyway. Yeah. Um, one of the things that they found was that the Germans, if some you know if something broke open, you know, like rations or something, mm -hmm. the Germans take some for themselves. But a real powerful incentive about that was there are a whole bunch of people standing outside the gate that need that that want a job. So if you pilfer, you're out of here, and there's yeah. ten other people that will take your place. Yeah. And so that's pretty. That's incentive. Was there pilferage? Yes, but it was actually compared to what it could have been was actually pretty uh, pretty limited in scope. Okay. Uh, there, a lot of people, Americans and Germans, talk about the uh, 
tremendous sense of purpose that they felt on the flight line. Um, you know that they were they were actively working to save save the city. Yeah. Was there a headcount of overall the number of of people who were involved with this operation? Um, there were about 225 C-54s, and then you add some of the others in there as well, each of them a crew of three, um, and then you add, you know, ground crews and things of that nature. It's hard to give a precise mm -hmm. number because it fluctuated in, over time. They, the air, airlift started small, as you noticed, right. and then it grew in stages over time. Um, I would say, you know, I'd go back to the comment that I made earlier is that two-thirds of the air transport fleet of the United States military was involved in this in some way. And so, you know, think you think of it in those terms and you realize this was a major U.S. commitment for sure. Yeah. And again, lessons learned from the uh, Berlin airlift uh, play a role in, in Korea is it, the airlifts in, in Korea were not this, to the same uh, size, but it required almost as much uh, organization. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially when you get the Chosin Reservoir where the Marines and attached Army troops are, are cut off and they have only one road that they can get out of through the Korean mountains. Um, so it's it's airdropping. It's also flying out wounded. It's flying in supplies um, to available airstrips. And then, of course, the famous thing is where the, the Chinese, communist Chinese have blown a bridge over a high gorge at a place called Funchilin Pass. And there's no there's a bridge engineer unit with the convoy, but there's no bridge. They don't have the sections they need to bridge the gap. And so these, you know, just using the same ingenuity, you know, we've never dropped sections of a Bailey bridge before. Let's we need to figure out how to do this in a matter of hours, basically a day or so. Mm -hmm. And they figure it out and they do it and they're able to get that convoy moving again. You know, so it, requ it requires a lot of the same techniques and a lot of the same creativity. It certainly is a different scale. Um, and it's also in the middle of a war as opposed to this, which is ostensibly a peacetime operation. Right. Uh, is there a suggested reading list that uh, you could uh, let folks know about that would help fill in the blanks on, on this very important piece of history? The Air Force and RAF official histories are very, very good, as is the U.S. Army official history that looks at, they did a book called Berlin, The City Becomes a Symbol, and looked at Berlin 1945 to 49. Those are outstanding. Um, one of the non-official sources that I will recommend that's highly readable and gives a great context is this book here, Candy Bombers by Andre mm -hmm. Cherny. Um, it, is, it is an outstanding overview of the airlift, puts it in the context of the 1948 presidential campaign, some of the diplomatic maneuvers that are going on, things of that nature, really gets into the personalities. A lot of the stories I was sharing with you in perspectives, um, he really explores in detail. Um, but I, I recommend this book, and then from there, if you want to go deeper into what he cites in his bibliography, go right ahead. Okay. The other one I would recommend, the last one I'll recommend is, is Gene Edward Smith's biography of Lucius Clay. He extensively used oral histories of General Clay before his death. And some of the some of the insight into Clay's thinking in that book is just just outstanding. Excellent. Any uh, final thoughts before we uh, wrap things up tonight? Yeah, this is an important story. Seventy five years ago, it's a great moment in the history of the independent Air Force, um, and it's a, it's a tremendous it's a tremendous moment in the history of the U.S. military. And um, I. I, I'm glad to see so many people were able to join us tonight and, and explore this history with us. And I would encourage people to explore it further because um, it's there's there's a lot here and it deserves deserves more recognition. Excellent. And uh, for those who are in the Madison area, uh, how can they find the museum? We are downtown on the square and the Capitol Square um, at 30 West Mifflin Street. You can find us. Um, our website is is whizvetsmuseum.com. You can also Google Wisconsin Veterans Museum. We do a variety of virtual programs and on-site programs as well. Um, and if actually, if you want to come and visit Russell Ramsey's uh, medals, including some of his flight gear from the airlift, we have them on display. Um, All right. So you can you can come on down to Madison and see it. But uh, whizvetsmuseum.com is our website. Sounds good. Chris, thank you again for uh, a great presentation. 
Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. You have such insights. I just I just enjoy every time we get together, and, and I'm sure we'll find another topic to talk about uh, as, as time goes on. No, that sounds great. It's always great working with you guys. And as you probably noticed from the pin here yep. on my collar, I'm a proud supporter of the CAF as well, so keep them <laughs> flying. And we thank you for that. By the way, for uh, those of you uh, joining us, thanks for being here tonight. If you have any thoughts or uh, comments, just send them to Leah Block at uh, media at cafhq.org. Until next week, I'm Steve Buss. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next Wednesday night.